When we talk about the smart home technologies, there are few questions that come to our mind. The first question is what exactly the smart home technologies are. Can we use these smart home technologies to enhance the comfort level of our living in these houses? Some other questions are, can we interact with these smart home devices even when we are not at home? Or most importantly, probably, what we want to know is, can these devices communicate with each other without the intervention of a human being and they can take the right decisions at right time? So the answer of all these questions is yes. Thanks to the smart home technologies that make these, all these things possible for us. But now the biggest question is how? How can these things be possible? And the answer of this question will be in my today's lecture, which is um, the introduction about the data analytics, how the data analytics and the interactive visualization can improve our decision making process. To begin with, there is an outline that in the beginning I will talk about why exactly do we need data analytics and data science or data visualization, um, what the problem is, uh, and then how we can bring the solution from the field of a data science. Later on, I will also talk about what are what data science is and what is data visualization and how it can be used to improve the life of the human being or how it can improve our decision making process. The most of the examples I'm going to give to you today are from my own research that I have done. So there will be a demo of uh, interactive visualization platform that we have developed previously for different stakeholders where I will give you some demonstration of different kind of case studies and we will explore together how these kind of interactive visualization can improve our decision making process. At the end, I will also talk about what are different kind of communication in the field of data science. Right, what the problem is. We are collecting a data from large velocity, volume, and variety from all different kind of resources. Thanks to Internet of Things, that now we can collect the data from our smartwatches uh, or the uh, weather information because we have sensors all around to collect the weather information. We are also collecting the data from our smart devices or the social media platforms. For example, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all these social media platforms are producing so much of data in milliseconds, right? When we have this large amount of data set, now the question is what exactly we need to communicate or what exactly we need to know from that huge amount of data set. What exactly is the insight of the data set that can help me to take the right decision and who is going to decide that what is the right kind of information from that huge amount of data set that we are collecting every second or every millisecond from all these devices or all these sensors. So this is the real question. Just to give you some examples of different kind of data sets, here you can see we can collect a data set. It could be as simple as you can see, like um, there is a very straight line of the data set. So you can use a very simple algorithm, for example, linear regression to process this, this kind of data set. However, data could be in this form when we have different kind of groups of similar kind of data set. So we have different kind of clusters of data and we need to understand how to process this kind of data. We, so we might need a different kind of technique to process this data. The data could be into this format where there is no particular uh, one line or uh, continuous uh, transition of the data, no, no particular clusters in the data, but the data is in the form of a loop. So what we need to know about this kind of data, how we are going to process it, process it and who is going to tell us uh, what kind of algorithm is required to process such kind of data. So another thing is data could be like this, when most of the uh, information or most of the patterns of data are inside one particular block that we call a very normal pattern of information, but then we have flares of data on different types. It means that there are some kind of extreme behavior of the data set. So there are normal pattern and also there are some extreme behavior of that data set. So how we are going to process such kind of data? 
Then finally, this example, when we have a data set clusters and clusters of data set, and this is such a complex data set where we don't know uh, what exactly we need to do with this kind of data set, such a complex and hard to understand kind of data set. So how to present such kind of complex data set? So this is the problem domain. Now we are going towards the solution domain. And the solution of this, these problems come from the field of data science or data analytics. So what data science or data analytics is? Data anal analysis or data science is basically a practical application of a wide range of analytical algorithms, computational methods, and expertise that are required to process that large amount of complex data set and then transform that data set into some valuable insight, into some kind of knowledge that we need to understand to take the right decision for our future. So the data science is a field which is uh, interdisciplinary, where we have a blended knowledge from different domains. For example, we, uh, a data scientist should have a knowledge and understanding from the field of computer science, mathematics, statistics. They also should know how the information systems work. As well as, along with this kind of knowledge, a data scientist should understand where they are going to apply that knowledge. For example, the application domain. So they should also be expert in that particular domain. So uh, in uh, summary, what we can do, we can summarize or we can categorize the whole field of data science into four different types. So the first field is descriptive analysis. The descriptive analytics is all about what we need to understand. For example, we have a lot of data set, we have a historical data set. So we are looking into the data set to understand what is happening, just what is happening. And that's called descriptive analysis. So we will have different kind of algorithms, different kind of techniques to understand what exactly is happening in the data set. Right. The other thing is diagnostic analysis. In the diagnostic analysis, we are trying to find out why exactly certain things are happening. So we have seen previously what is happening in our data set. Now we are curious to know why certain patterns of information or certain pattern of behavior is happening in my data set. That's called diagnostic analysis. And later on in my talk, I will give you some examples of the diagnostic and as well as descriptive analysis. So the third kind of analytics is predictive analysis. As the name itself explains it, predictive analysis is all about, okay, if these are the things happening in the past or in the, my historical data, what will be happening in the future? That is all about the forecasting of the future. So that's called predictive analysis. So we have done what, why, and what is going to happen in the future. Now the most important thing for us to know is, if we understand or understood of our, our data set, we know where the problem is, what exactly we need to do. That's where the pre, uh, prescriptive analytics comes into uh, this domain. So prescriptive analysis is all about, you take the right decision based on what you have analyzed. So pres prescriptive analysis gives you algorithm where you can analyze your data set, you get the right information, and you pass that message to the stakeholder to take the right decision for the future. That's called prescriptive analysis. Okay, now we have spoken about so many things like all these complex algorithms. We have spoken about uh, why these algorithms are important. We have spoken about that why we need to process our data set. But the most important thing is how we are going to communicate the results of all these algorithms with our stakeholders who might not understand all these complexities of the results. In that particular time, we need visualization. So visualization is basically a graphical representation of your results or the analysis of the results which you want to show to your stakeholders where users can actually interact with the visuals and they can get an insight of the data. So before uh, going to the further part of my presentation, 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you one interactive visualization platform. This platform actually uh, we have developed previously for different kind of stakeholders. So we wanted to show this platform to the government agencies, to the energy providers, to the uh, housing agencies, as well as to the householders to, in order to understand where people are using most of their energy, why they are using that energy. To, in order to, so in order to develop this platform, we needed a very comprehensive amount of data set. So we did all the brainstorming that we need a data set from the house ontology. Like we need inf information about the houses. We need information about the EPC rating of the building. We need information about the demographic of uh, the people living in the, those houses. As well as we need information about the energy that is being used in those houses. So when we have collected that data set, actually that data set has been collected from the area of the Manchester. Um, so when we collected that data set, now the real point was to use it for creating our interactive platform. So we did all the analytics in behind the scene and then we popped in all of that data set into our interactive visualization um, platform. So this is what uh, an interactive visualization platform looks like. Now, for example, this platform provides you information from two different perspectives. One, from the regional point of view, where different stakeholders, for example, the energy providers uh, they, or the government agencies or the um, uh, over housing agencies, they can look into the data at the regional level. And we can also go into detail of the house level for our stakeholders that are the householders. For example, uh, let's build up a story or let's be, build up a case study, right? I am an um, energy <laughs> provider and I am interest, interested to know in these particular 34 houses where we have collected the data, what are those houses that have used greater than 100 kilowatt per hour energy or electricity, right? So you will see as soon as I will click on the 100 kilowatt hour of the energy, the whole platform will reconfigure itself, which means that there will be an auto reconfiguration according to the case study that I want to explore. So I have clicked on greater than 100 kilowatt per hour. As you can see, as soon as I have clicked on the 100 kilowatt per hour, the whole platform has been changed and now it is displaying the information that is only relevant to those houses that have used greater than 100 kilowatt hour energy, right? So you can see it has shown me the occupancy of the people uh, who are living in those houses, the family structure. Uh, it has given the information about the building, what kind of buildings they are. They are usually the flats. They build up in the 1960s, um, archetype of the building and also their current EPC level. So there are total five houses that have been, that were using more than 100 kilowatt per hour and we can see the information about those five houses here, right? Now, I'm the householder and I want to understand what is happening inside each house where we are using greater than 100 kilowatt per hour energy, right? So maybe for example, I want to click uh, into three and I want to click, I want to go inside the house. So uh, there is a descriptive information. This is called, mostly called descriptive analysis where we are seeing about the information about the house that has been using more than 100 kilowatt hour. Although you can see the EPC rating is A, but still those people are using higher than 100 kilowatt per hour. It means that there is, some, there is nothing wrong with the architecture of the building or the insulation of the building. There is something, maybe the, uh, the way people are using the house that needs to be retrofitting, right? So what we are going to do, we are going now to the house level, deep inside to our data. Right, so once we are deep inside one house, now we can see that we can click on one of the category, for example, electricity, or we want to see where we have used most of the electricity in our house. So we are using, we are clicking on the electricity and we can see that most of the electricity has been used for the appliances and maybe in the living room. And as soon as I click on uh, one of the tab in my chart, 
my um, heat map also converts accordingly. So it is showing me the pattern of energy that is being used in the house uh, in different parts or in different timings of the day. So by looking into this kind of uh, uh, visualization of your data set, now you can actually figure out where the problem is. Right? And these kind of uh, visualization platforms actually help you to understand uh, what are the right decisions being a different stakeholder you can take. Either you want to retrofit the building or you want to uh, educate the people for the behavior of uh, who are interacting with those devices or the appliances in the house. Now you can take the right decision, decision being a different stakeholder. Okay, uh, we are going to move towards the... Uh, second half of my presentation where I'm going to talk about um, what are different kind of uh, communication in the field of data science. Basically, in the field of data science, there are three different kind of communication. One is human to human communication. Second is machine to machine communication. And the third is machine to human communication. And I'm going to take you deep inside all of these communication and I will give you some examples from my own research that I have done in the past. Right, the human to human communication. In this particular kind of communication, the human, they go to a particular site, they collect the data set, they store the data set, they clean the data set, they apply different kind of algorithms to process that data set. Now they collect the right information or the knowledge from that uh, huge amount of data we have collected. And they are the one, the data scientists are the one who are communicating the results back to the audience or back to the stakeholder. So human are collecting the data, they are processing the data, and they are giving the information back to our clients. That's called human to human communication. So it could be in the form of some presentation, some visualization, or anything that you want to do, right? So one example here, you can see, um, this is the heat map. That's one example of the diagnostic analysis. So in the heat map, you can see that um, there are certain pattern of energy consumption. So people, uh, so on the x-axis, there is a time, uh, time frame. And on the y-axis, different number of, uh, number of days. So people, uh, you, uh, the the yellow and red is telling you the highest energy consumption and the, where there are blue tiles, it tells you the lowest energy consumption. So in the middle of, in the uh, beginning of the day, when we start our day, for example, half six or seven o'clock, there is more energy consumption. Then in the middle of the day, the energy consumption has been reduced. And then as you can see, towards the end of the day, there is more, when the people return back to their houses, there is more energy consumption at that time of the day, like half five to uh, 10 or 11 o'clock. And then from 11 o'clock until morning, there is again a silence, there is not much energy consumption. So just by looking into the heat map, different stakeholders can understand what is the pattern of energy usage in our smart home. This is one example. Right, so after human to human communication, the next thing is machine to machine communication. And this is where the fun part is actually. So machines are talking with each, with each other without the intervention of a human being. And thanks to all the artificial intelligence, ambience intelligence, and the context aware analysis that we can perform these tasks. So the example of machine to machine uh, communication is smart homes and smart cities. So we have smart gardening, we have smart healthcare system, so we have smart appliances, smart gardening. So we actually have made the automation of our houses the way devices are communicating with each other. So devices are communicating with each other, they are understanding what is happening in the house so they can take the right decision for the future. That's called machine to machine communication. Another example uh, is from the cyber physical system. So cyber physical system is an other example of automation where you connect all the physical and the cyber components uh, together where they work seamlessly, they are integrated seamlessly with each other and they can communicate together. So the example I want to give you is from my own research I have done with the Electrolux and the Volkswagen company. 
So I uh, actually I have visited few time um, Electrolux and Volkswagen in Europe, where we have developed the smart components for their existing products. So what we did, for example, uh, in the field of uh, for the Electrolux company, we have created a platform where you can create the smart services for the existing refrigerator. Now, the refrigerator can actually sense what kind of food is present inside that refrigerator. And how the refrigerator itself can adjust its cooling setting according to the food items we have in the refrigerator. Now you can see, without the intervention of the human being, the machine is actually communicating with the things that are present in the refrigerator and it is getting a feedback what kind of things are present and it is adjusting its cooling system. What we have done here? We have saved a lot of energy, we have saved our food, and we have enhanced the sustainability of our product and as well as of our uh, food. And similar example I can give you from my uh, Volkswagen company. So we developed a smart infrastructure for the, for the cars where the car itself adjusts its heating system based on the weather that is outside. Now, the people, they don't have to interact with the heating system. They will just sense what is the weather outside and it, it, it will adjust automatically the heating system. That's called machine to machine communication. Right, now we are moving towards the end of our presentation where I will show you what is machine to human communication. So in the machine to human communication, the machines are actually collecting all the information, for example, uh, IoT devices, the sensors that are collecting the weather information. So all these machines, they are collecting the information, they are processing the data, they are collecting the right kind of um, uh, data and they are giving, processing it and they are producing the right kind of information. So once they have done it, now the time is to give that information back to the users. So that is called machine to human communication. For example, the variable smart devices, right? So in these devices, these devices are continuously monitoring our heart rate, our BMI, our maybe our walking pattern, and then it is informing us back what kind of conditions I'm suffering at the moment, right? So machines are collecting the information, machines are processing the data, and now machines are giving us suggestion what we can do next to improve our health, for example, right? So this example is from machine to human communication. There are many more other examples. For example, um, you can see that the security alert, weather app, health app, alert messages, all these examples are machine to human communication. Here, in this particular slide, this is just for to give you an idea what kind of things happen at the data level when we perform a certain activity. For example, in this particular diagram, I can tell you we have trained our smart house, please switch off all the uh, lights of the house when there is no one in the house. So in that particular case, we need to understand the ontology of the building. So the in building should communicate with the human. If there is a human or not in the house, then there is an ICT ontology. And there's a lot of communication happening behind the scene, which is the data level communication. But it might not be easier for us to understand all that communication. We might need to simplify it in order to show that <coughs> communication to our stakeholders who have no interest maybe in the complex algorithm. What we can do? So here is an example how the visualization actually make things happen or make things easier for people to understand. So this is basically a blueprint of the visualization platform that we have seen previously. I have, I have first created this blueprint of the information platform that this is what I want to show on my platform and later on I have developed that platform. So visually, how, how easy it is to interact with our data. So this is the purpose of the interactive visual analysis or collaborative visual analysis where you see the visuals, you interact with the visualization and you take the right decision. So 
we are now towards the end of our presentation. In this presentation, we have seen how the smart home technologies have improved the overall quality of living in the house, how they can enhance our comfort level, how they can enhance our living standard in the house. So how these smart home technologies, IoT, cyber physical systems, advanced AI, they have improved the overall quality of living in the houses. Then we have also seen the interactive visualization, how they enable the communication with the home devices. Like for example, uh, all the devices that are working on the network, they are seamlessly integrated and they are communicating with each other to perform a specific task, right? But what we are seeing, we are just visualizing through the charts and the graphs that what exactly is happening. And the last thing is how surprising it is that the devices that we have installed in our houses or the appliances, they are learning from our behavior and they are adjusting how to behave in the future. So this is what the smart home technologies is and this is what we can do with all these amazing technology that we are developing and we will continuously will be developing. Thank you very much for listening to today's presentation. Thank you, Shamela. That was a fascinating presentation. So congratulations. Um, personally, I was particularly interested in the uh, live data feed you were extracting from the homes. I, I don't know about others, but in my, in my own house, it'd be fascinating to be able to understand which appliances in the house were using you know, what particular levels of energy, for instance. And, and also, I start thinking about having an electric car. Mm -hmm. And um, then I think, well, will my wife be paying for my effectively my petrol tank to be filled? So it'd be nice to be our bills to say, well, you've, you, you spent this much on uh, charging your car yesterday. So, so that I guess the analytics would be needed for that sort of thing, yes. to be able to dis distinguish a washing machine from, a, from yes. charging your car, etc. Yes, so you need a very powerful analytics behind the scene that are processing that complex amount of data set and take the right decision for the future, you know. So uh, there is a very heavily analytical task happening behind the scene. This is where the data analytics, they work on the data set and they produce all these kind of machine learning algorithms. They produce different kind of data mining and data analysis algorithm where we can dig inside the data and we can see what are the right kind of information that can help us to take the right decision. Yeah, so yes, so hopefully our energy providers will, will have super, <laughs> super bills in the future. Um, okay, so I, I've got a couple of questions for you, um, if you don't mind. Um, for those that are interested particularly in the subject that have been listening today, um, wh where did your interest in computer science and digital analytics come from? And how did that lead to the inspiring career that you have today? Well, um, to be honest, I always wanted to be a doctor uh, because the country I have come from, um, the medical profession is considered one of the most prestigious profession in our country, like Pakistan. However, I could not, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but I could not meet the criteria or the merit. Um, so then I decided to pursue my education in the field of computer science. So I started my undergraduate degree in the computer science. And it is then um, when I was so surprised at how much the science and technology has been advanced and how much inspiring things we can, we can do by using these kind of technologies, right? So I decided to pursue my education further uh, in uh, computing and information systems. So I came to UK for my further education for my master's degree in 2009. Uh, so I completed my degree um, uh, in computing and information systems. I got a distinction and the university, they offered me a scholarship to uh, carry on my research. Um, so I completed my research in AI driven um, the decision support tool for the early prediction of uh, neurological diseases. So this is where I realized that how we can empower our information systems with the advanced AI techniques to make it more valuable or more inspiring for our audience or for the stakeholders who really don't understand the data set, right? Uh, or the complexities of the algorithms. And later on, um, I have also worked with Volkswagen uh, and Electrolux and where I was so inspired that how you can enhance the overall life of the product um, by just give, adding more smart services to the existing product, right? So these smart, smart services actually they can uh, uh, respond to the uh, things which, without the intervention of the human beings. So all these things has inspired me so much that I continued with this field and I'm hoping to keep continue and inspire other people as well. 
Well, you're certainly doing that today, so thank you, Shamela. Uh, just, just one more question from me, and then we'll, we'll ask for some questions from the audience and those online. Um, do you see there being a, a, a large step change in the power of AI in the future? I mean, for instance, I still have an argument with my car when I use, try and use the speech recognition. I say, please, can I go to Manchester? And it says, no problem, I'll route you to Glasgow, for instance. So there's still some problems there. But do you, do you see these being ironed out? Or, or, or you know, is it going to be progressive? Or are we going to see a big step change in, in the coming years? Thank you, Paul. I think that's a very wonderful question. Um, well, technology is evolving, you know, it's continuously evolving. So we can see the advancement in the technology, even every single day, you know, there are new things happening in the field of science and technology. Um, and the most recent examples, uh, like in the recent years, you can see that the Internet of Things and the cyber physical systems, um, how they have improved the overall quality of living in the house. For, for example, in the cyber physical systems, um, where the physical and the virtual components, they are together over the uh, network and they are communicating with each other, right? So how inspiring it is that we are using all the advanced AI and the machine learning to make our devices to communicate with each other. So I think that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, advancement in the field of technology. And similarly, um, we can see in the, uh, when I was working with the Electrolux, we have designed a component of the machine where if there is particular component of the machine which is faulty, you know, and the machine itself will uh, notify to the remote maintenance machine that this particular component is going to be faulty. Uh, and then they take the right decision to, uh, you know, improve uh, that component without, um, uh, you know, before it gets expired. So they improve that component so that, uh, you know, they can enhance the overall life of that product. So how inspiring it is, again, you know, to look at the things when the things are managing itself. So I think there is n no stop to it. And we will be continuously uh, looking into the power of the AI, robotics, automation, cyber physical systems, and we will use these technologies to improve the overall quality of the local of the people. That's great. And of course, there's a, we've built a smart house, haven't we, in the School of yeah. Computing Engineering? We, we've built a house inside one of the university yes. buildings, which is a smart house. So no doubt you're working yes. with colleagues in, with yes. that as well. So we have a very wonderful facility in the uh, University of Huddersfield, Huddersfield, where we have a two-story building of the smart house. So we have smart appliances. And we are uh, working with the smart house we are, where we are planning to do the more fabulous work by using this all advanced technology, for example, collaborative visual advanced machine learning algorithm, advanced AI techniques, and how we can use the power of the smart home to improve the overall quality of the life um, of the people. Yes. Thank you, Shumaya. So I'll now ask if there's any questions from, from anyone in the room here or online. Yeah, okay, question left. So just, just for the benefit of those online, I'm going to try and summarise quite a long question, but, but in essence the question is around the ownership of data in a social environment, how it's used, um, and obviously how that interacts with the person that, that's living in that home, and are there potentially any contra no contradictions or controversies within that, or conflicts in that? Yes, um, thank you very much for this question. I think the question holds a very valuable insight itself, you know, how we can manage the large amount of data that is coming from different environments, right? And who owns that data? Um, the thing is, the privacy is one of the most important issues that still is there. Uh, you know, we, uh, when, even if we are working in the companies or we, we own a house that is continuously producing a data, the social media, there is a privacy factor that, uh, f uh, you know, uh, forbid, uh, forbid the use of uh, that data to a certain extent, you know, so they don't let you explore that data until a certain extent. But here, uh, I think um, these days, the open source data set where different companies are very much interested to share their data set with the other organizations. So we call it a cross disciplinary data set. So we collect the data set from different domains and we create a centralized data database, which is uh, uh, again, according to the rules and according to the principles uh, or the GDPR, we make it accessible for our analysts to use that data set. So they are the ones. So once have we have that access of the data so openly from these different organizations or those who want who are willing to share their data set, uh, people can actually 
uh, see that how collaboratively or comprehensively they can use that data set to perform different kind of tasks. For example, the data might be coming from the hospitals or from the housing agencies and uh, from uh, the local residence uh, building. So uh, someone uh, should, you know, uh, someone take uh, the responsibility to collect that data uh, within the framework of the privacy prevention, you know, and then explore that data and see that how that data could be used for different kind of applications. I hope this answers your your question. Thank you, Shimaila. Do we have any more questions in the room or oh, one online? Okay, so the question is, do inaccuracies exist in the communication methods and, and how are those mitigated? Right. Um, so th this is again a very valid question, you know, to uh, according to the trustworthiness of the results we are producing, you know, uh, from the different data set we are collecting or the analytics we are performing. Um, what I would say, not 100% everything is perfect. You know, it's most like a try, try um, and see kind of uh, a message. You know, you look into the data to pr you produce the results, and then you improve. You keep improving your algorithms. You know, for example, sometimes your algorithms are producing 80% accuracy. You know, and you still wonder where the 20% uh, you know inaccuracy coming from. So. The data scientists, they are always exploring that why uh, how, and how we can improve the accuracy result of our algorithms. You know, not every algorithm is 100% accurate to give you the result. But as I said, a data scientist should have a knowledge from the mathematical field and they should have also understanding about what kind of analytical algorithm will be a right kind of algorithm to, uh, you know, um, to mitigate that kind of um, anomaly in our results. So definitely with the, the more you will uh, expert yourself or you get a knowledge or deep understanding about the analytics, you will better understand your data and you will be able to better produce that data set for your audience. Thank you, Shamila. So the question is, is, there, is the interactive visual model uh, seen as a standard in this, in this field? Um, I won't say that this is a standard or the only approach to communicate the, uh, uh, your results. As I have said previously, um, a data scientist should also be an expert in the domain knowledge, right? So it might possible uh, in the human-to-human uh, -human communication, we are performing all the difficult tasks, all the complexities, all the analytic work, um, and then we as a human being, we are communicating that data to our stakeholders. It's not necessarily the visualization platform. However, visualization platform gives you the facility to explore in your own way. So it gives you kind of uh, uh, freedom that you are going to interact in your own way, in your customized way to the level, different level of information to extract the information to all that different level where you want to see the information. I might be wrong being a human being to interpret the results, but you, because you have a power or you have the freedom to explore yourself to the extent where you want to see the results, you can, uh, you know, get the you can be facilitated with the, these interactive visualization. I think that's the power of the interactive visualization. You really don't need the support of all these uh, data scientists or the uh, you know other people who can make things understandable for you. So the platform itself is sufficient enough that you can explore in your own way and get the right information from there. Thank you, Shamila. Another question. Very good. So, how do external factors influence the way in which data is? Interpreted is, is the question, and does the goal for autonomy always outweigh user preference? Right. So um, I would say external factors always have a huge influence the way you interpret your results. For example, if we talk about within the context of the smart energy and smart homes, it might possible the uh, because the environment or the climate is different in UK but uh, than in Asia, right? So when we talk about the external factors um, uh, like that are affecting the energy consumption in uh, UK, it might be different than those external factors that are affecting to the uh, energy efficiency in an Asian country where most of the time there is a hot environment, right? So their external factors could be different as compared to the external factors that are in UK or in Europe. So there is definitely a chance that the different external factors in, uh, impact on our data differently. But again, this is the duty of a data scientist, you know, to understand how to interpret, the, how to process that data 
comprehensively, collectively by keeping all, this is called context aware um, understanding of the data set or context aware um, uh, processing of your data set where you are not only focusing on the actual data set but you are also taking the context into the framework and you are processing the whole data set the comprehensive data set together to see like what are the external factors that are affecting the outcome of our results so definitely there is the influence of the external factors on the data set or the processing or the analytics Thank you, another question in the room Thank you. So the, the question in summary relates to the fact that in essence an AI system creates a black box approach and you know how do we understand how that, that effective that solution came about given that effectively it's an AI solution rather than maybe an implicit model? Right. Um, thank, you. thank you again for a wonderful question. Um, Again, it depends on the perspective where you are coming from. So, you know, for a person who is very naive or who does not understand or who does not want to understand the complexities of the algorithms that are working behind the scene, maybe they they want to work that kind of black box. You know, they don't want to understand what the complexities are of the AI machine, uh, you know, how it is working. For those kind of people, I think that that's a kind of a blessing. Um, I would say, you know, they, they are getting the benefit or they are being facilitated with all the AI and the advancements in the AI and, and on the other side they don't have to interact what exactly is happening behind the scene um, but if you talk about um, a data scientist uh, you know who is very much uh, you know uh, interested to understand what exactly the um, and the algorithms are working behind yes for those people uh, this is a question to explore, um, you know, like what exactly the uh, algorithms are working behind. And, uh, you know, people are actually working on those side as well, you know, how uh, they look into the algorithms, they are always trying to improve those algorithms. But again, if you have an excess of uh, those algorithms, you know, that that are working as a as a black box. So it's, it is a blessing for those people who don't want to uh, know their data set. And it's again, uh, is a uh, you know kind of challenging for those people who really want to dig into that level where they want to understand the analytics that is working behind uh, those AI and robotics or automation and all those different advancements. Yeah, it's an interesting question as well from my perspective. I'm an engineer and quite often we develop physics models and sometimes we've applied AI um, as an alternative solution and you always sort of think, well, you know, we're used to a physics model. Do I trust the outputs of this AI model? Because I guess in some ways, if you have a physics model, you can compare the outputs, can't you? You can almost validate the AI solution. But I guess in some of these more sort of um, social type problems, you, it's more difficult to validate the, the outputs, I guess, is it? As a yes, exactly. I agree. You have to tr kind of yes, trust your trust data. Your <laughs> trust your data. <laughs> and, uh, yes, and trust your provider that whatever machine you are using, it will work for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I don't know whether there are any more questions. Great. Okay, one more. In the room. <coughs> I suppose you just yes. So, so, so the question for the benefit of those online is relates to the quality of data and, yes. and, and you know how, how do you handle that as a data scientist? Yes. Again, a very wonderful question. So, um, in my talk, I have already spoken about where you have a, uh, a you know normal pattern of the data set at one point, and then you also get different flares of the data set, and you are always surprised, you know, where that extreme behavior is coming from. Sometimes that extreme behavior is might be a malfunctioning of the sensors that are collecting that data set or some other times it could be something that is uh, the peak of the information you know so for example um, when i was looking into my energy data set i realized at one day there was extremely high energy consumption and i was I was just wondering why, you know, there's so much energy consumption in that particular day and it is, doesn't match with the rest of the day. And when I looked into the data, it was uh, the Christmas day, for example. So, mm. so Christmas day and uh, I realized that how it makes sense that now this is not an abnormal data or abnormal uh, pattern of behavior. This is something which is normal, uh, but it does give you some kind of outliers in your data set, but it's not a, an actual outlier. So this is one part of, of the answer. Another part is, being a data scientist, you also believe the pre-processing of the data set. 
So the more you process your data set before the application of the machine learning algorithm, before all these analytics, the better the quality of the results you will, you will get. So being a data scientist, you should know that what are the extreme behavior, what are just the outliers I should remove from the data set, and what are different techniques to remove those outliers, and what are the normal data set or the normal pattern of behavior I need to analyze. Thank you. Thank you, Shumaila. Do we have any more questions? I've, I've got one, uh, one question I could ask you. Um, so, so when I've been involved with data science projects, again, from an engineering perspective, you mentioned before about domain knowledge. So as a data scientist, your domain knowledge is data science, obviously. But then how do you actually build that domain knowledge to create the system? Do you, do you sometimes have to work with the domain experts or do you try and learn a lot about that particular domain yourself? How does that work? That's again a very good question. As I mentioned in my data science definition that a data scientist should have a knowledge and understanding about the application where they are going to apply that knowledge, right? So when I say a domain knowledge, it is it is related to the area where they are applying the knowledge. For example, it could be finance, it could be energy, automobile industry or anything. You know, you should have an understanding how the products or the things behave over there. You know, and this is where you can bring your uh, analytics in perspective. You know, so oh, this is uh, what I want to do. This is how I want to do, and this is what I want to extract from that data set. So, being a domain expert means that you should have some basic knowledge and understanding of the area where you are going to apply that knowledge. If yeah, that, that that makes sense, and mm -hmm. it's essential actually for a successful it, data project, it's isn't it? Yes. Found. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I think we're getting close to, to the end of the session. So, so Shamaila, did, yes, you, did you want to? Yes, I just want to say thank you to everyone who are listening online or who are present in this uh, room. And I also want to tell you that in our university, um, we are providing an MSc Data Science. Um, so we ha I'm, I'm the course leader of MSc Data, uh, data Analytics course in the uh, School of Computing and Engineering. And we have three different provisions of our data analytics course for the MSc where uh, students, they can be in campus and they can finish their degree in one year's time. However, sometimes, uh, you know, th those people who are geographically at a distant uh, place or those people who are working or the ladies who, uh, you know, after raising up their children, they might be looking up a career in the field of data science. So uh, we also provide uh, a provision for uh, distance learning provision for those people so they can learn from their home environment. And we are always here to guide them and take them through the journey uh, of this um, data analytics course with us. And we have a third provision where we provide uh, you know, uh, where the student can also start uh, six months w uh, work along with the um, uh, uh, one year degree. So we have these three provisions and uh, please feel free to contact me using my email and um, uh, I will get back to you if you are interested more into our MSc data analytics course in the University of Huddersfield at School of Info uh, Computing and uh, Engineering and Computing. Thank you very much, Shumail, and some thank really good advice well. there on International Women's Day. So, so I'd just like to uh, thank everybody in the room uh, and, and those online for joining us today. Um, and just to keep an eye out for future Discover lectures, I believe the, uh, the next lecture is on nuclear waste and a sustainable future. Are they compatible? So keep an eye out for that one. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Paul.